I feel since uh, Hans Hoppe gave an excellent lecture on praxeology last night, I feel I should just ask you, I say, well, he's already given the lecture, so there's no need for me to repeat the lecture. We can all, we can all leave, but I don't think they would let me get away with that. Uh, one uh, thing is you'll discover if you don't, uh, haven't realized already, I, I speak in a very uh, soft voice, not very loud, and I'm also at a monotone. Uh, on the monotone, some people advise if you have a recording of the speech, just speed up the recording about a, <laughs> most people recommend a one, start with a 170.75 and then <laughs> work your way, whatever, whatever is suitable. Uh, when, uh, as far as uh, speaking loudly, I remember uh, people have told me, uh, eat the microphone. I, I don't propose to do that. It doesn't, <laughs> doesn't sound like it would be a good idea. It's really not in my diet plan. <laughs> uh, but one other story, you know, on uh, speaking loudly, uh, w once uh, uh, Robert Nozick gave a talk and said, "If you're, if you're, if, if you can't hear me in the back, uh, let me know." And somebody yelled out, uh, "We can't hear you in the front." So he said, "Well, go to the back where you can hear me." <laughs> uh, now, I'm going to talk uh, today about. Uh, some of the basic ideas of praxeology. This is a, uh, they, uh, from a philosophical point of view. Now, uh, one thing I like to point out, the word from my, I heard from my great friend, Father James Sadowski, like to tell people, the word philosophy comes from the Greek word philosophia, which means philosophy. <laughs> uh, one, although uh, I'm speaking on the philosophical aspects of praxeology, one point I think is very important to make is that although uh, Austrian economists such as uh, Mises and Rothbard are tend to be very interested in philosophy and they're interested in the philosophical aspects of economics. Uh, praxeology is not an attempt to solve the basic problems of philosophy. Uh, particularly, it's not an attempt to solve the problem of other minds or the problem of skepticism. Uh, by that, I, I have in mind something like this. Uh, there are people who will ask a question like this. They'll say, well, uh, suppose I look at the various arguments about praxeology, and they seem to me convincing, or I think there's something to that, but how do I know that applies to anybody else. Maybe this is just about my own mind. How do I know that there are other minds who also think in this way? Uh, well, in remember, uh, praxeology is, is, is one of the sciences. It's not a, not a branch of philosophy. It's not epistemology, a theory of knowledge, or metaphysics. It's a, one of the sciences. And in the sciences, we assume the ordinary world of common sense. Say, uh, physicists don't say, well, we're looking at all these part, uh, material particles. We're looking at them through uh, various instruments and measuring them, but they don't say, 
how do we know any of this exists at all? Maybe how do we know there is uh, there isn't absolutely nothing? Uh, they don't ask questions like that. They just assume that the material world exists. So, in a, in the same it, in the same way, in economics, in praxeology, we're trying to we're assuming that there are other people and that these people are actors. We don't have that as a as a question. We don't have say a question. How do I know? Say that I know that I'm thinking, but how do I know that any of you are thinking? Maybe you're just all cleverly disguised robots who are producing sounds. How do I know that you have thoughts in the way that I do, or at least I think I do? Uh, Praxeology isn't an attempt to uh, solve the problem of other minds. One of my uh, philosophers I knew at uh, UCLA, uh, Robert Yost, used to say people ask him, uh, do you think other minds exist? He would say, not very many of them. <laughs> so, uh, as I say, we're not in praxeology trying to solve these philosophical problems. And uh, so this, as you'll see, will come up, this point will come up later. Just one further example of how we're not in praxeology, we're not trying to solve these philosophical problems. Supposing, say, we're looking at the Austrian theory of the business cycle, say we're trying to show how this explains the 1929 U.S. Depression, say in comparison with the Milton Friedman's theory or uh, other theories, it wouldn't make much sense to say, well, you're trying to ask how the Depression came about. We haven't even established that other people exist, so how can we ask this question? You see, as I say, uh, praxeology isn't an attempt to solve these fundamental philosophical questions. So now we want to deal with the basic notion that uh, of Austrian economics of action, where an action is goal-directed behavior. It's a, you, the actor has a, a certain goal in mind, and he has a, a, an idea of means or, that he can use to achieve that goal. So he has this, so we have this basic structure of ends and means. Uh, it's very important in action, at least as we're talking about it in Austrian economics, we'll usually refer to mo uh, motions or movements of someone's body. It they d doesn't have to. We can think of actions that don't involve movements of someone's body. Uh, other than, and I have in mind, other than the point you'll, where people say, well, waiting is an action. But uh, we can have other examples where uh, there is no motion of a person is still, oh, I, I knew I touched the screen, I shouldn't have. Oh, well, we've, we've got a problem already. Uh, I knew this would happen, that was, that was an action. Um, <laughs> always waving to me. So I was giving an example. I'm trying to come up with a case where somebody will uh, act even though there's no physical motion of the body. So I could just say, well, uh, will all of those of you who agree with me that there is such a case please 
signify this by remaining seated. So since nobody stood up, you've all agreed with me. So, but that's an action. You've agreed with me. You haven't done anything. So that would be a case where uh, you can act even though you haven't done anything. Now, uh, Peter Klein used to ruin things for me by I'm saying, would everybody who agrees with me uh, please signify by remaining seated? He would just stand up. So that, was, that isn't a counterexample, but it just threw me off stride. It's <laughs> not, not a nice thing to do. So now, so that's, uh, I think we have a basic idea of what action is. It, uh, one point about action also, we have to, we have in mind uh, that uh, for action to take place, the future can't be certain in the sense that we know what would happen we know it would happen regardless of whether I act or not. Uh, supposing I say I know uh, this room is going to be blown up in two minutes and I don't think there's anything I can do about it. So then it would be no point to acting in that, in that case. I would have to uh, just... Uh, I would have to have some way of thinking that what I would do would have some effect on what would take place in the future. Now, it doesn't, one uh, point uh, that's very important here is uh, uh, Joe Salerno mentioned this in his lecture. It doesn't, when he was mentioning uh, the criticisms that uh, Mies is made of Karl Menger, it doesn't have to be the case that the person has a correct idea of what will affect the future. It just he has some idea, he, it's just his view of what will happen. He thinks that doing such and such will aid him in achieving what he wants, supposing, say, someone believes that uh, you can injure your enemies by making a wax image of them and then sticking pins in, in the image. Uh, so even if, the, if that uh, is a wrong idea, it doesn't have any effect. It's still something he's, he's doing. Uh, although I must say it's it's worked for me every time I've tried it. <laughs> uh, one point also on knowing the future, there's an argument sometimes people give I don't think is a very good one. You may have heard, some of you may be familiar with this argument. They'll say, well, uh, you can't predict what someone will do and then tell the person what the prediction is because then if they you tell them what the prediction is then they can just say well I'm not going to do what you predicted just to, because I want to show your prediction is wrong so that shows you can't predict what someone's going to do and then tell them about it. Now, uh, can anybody tell me what's wrong with that argument? Are there several things? Or, uh, of course, if you think it's right, tell me what's right with it. Does anyone have any, any ideas about that? Uh, yeah. Ah, uh, so your point was if you if uh, you you uh, know that somebody's going to do the opposite of 
what you say, and you could just predict they'll do the opposite. Well, that is an interesting suggestion. It's a very good suggestion, but it isn't quite the case I have in mind where it isn't your, it, I'm dealing with you're predicting a, a particular thing and rather than a different prediction that you would have made taking account of the person's reaction. It says, I'm predicting you're going to do such and such and I'm telling you about that. So what, uh, is there a problem with that? Oh, oh yes. Um, would it be that you're changing the person's uh, given information which could potentially change their ends and thus their means? Oh, uh, but the prediction is, so you're saying when you make the prediction, you're, oh, when you make the prediction, you're ch uh, possibly changing what the person's information was but supposing the information includes that you're giving them pr the prediction, you're, this is what the prediction is. Uh, well, uh, those are very good suggestions, but I think one, a couple problems with the argument are first, it's just, the most obvious one is it's just assuming that the uh, the conclusion is true, namely that the person's is assuming that the prediction is false, namely that telling them about the prediction will upset the prediction. And we could come up with cases where this doesn't seem very plausible. For example, I suppose I say, uh, well, you're not going. I'm predicting of each one of you that you're not going to go out and murder someone during lunchtime. Well, you could say, okay, just to show that <laughs> Gordon is really doesn't know what he's talking about, as if that needed any demonstration. You, go, you can do, uh, kill, kill somebody just to upset my prediction, but if prediction's right, you're not going to. So it's just really begging the question. It's assuming that, that the prediction is false. And uh, a relate, related to this really is we could say, well, isn't it in some sense logically possible, however unlikely, that you could uh, act in a way that's different from the prediction? Uh, it isn't a requirement of um, Make predicting what somebody going to do that it's logically impossible that the person do something else. For example, suppose I say I predict that a certain person will win the lottery and the person does win the lottery, then it would seem that I'm successfully predicting he's he's won the lottery, but it isn't that it's it's certainly logically possible that he didn't win. In fact, it was extremely unlikely that he did win, but I predicted it. So it isn't a requirement of predicting something that it's logically necessary, that it must uh, happen. So I think that's what's wrong with that argument. Now, the question now comes up, which uh, Hans Hoppe dealt with in his lecture last night, is how do we know that human beings act? And here, uh, Hans mentioned an argument, which I think is a, a very good one, although I look at the argument a little bit differently from uh, his use of it. Uh, the argument he gave was supposing someone denies that people act. Somebody says, well, I don't think there is such a thing as action. So his very 
is very saying that would be an action. He's saying, I don't think people act. So in denying action, he's act he's acting himself. So he's showing that his own argument is wrong when he says there human beings don't act. That is an action. That's uh, that's uh, sometimes called a retortion argument. It's showing kind of that the argument is self-undermining. Now, I think that's a very that's a very good argument. But I think in this uh, perhaps where I differ a bit, I think that the main way we know that human beings act is just it's part of our ordinary experiences. We all act. We do it all the time. We say, you decided to come to this lecture, and you you did come. You're now thinking, well, you probably made a mistake, yeah. but it's a requirement of the program, but otherwise you'd all be leaving. <laughs> Maybe some of you will be leaving, even though it is a requirement of the program. But the main way we know we act is that uh, we it's part of our experience now what's the the point where i think people might place too much importance on this self refutation argument is this uh, what what I suppose the as, as it seems right, the argument is right that the person who's denying that uh, people act is himself acting. So that shows that there's at least one action, namely the person who's denied action is acting. But it doesn't follow from that that uh, all that action is a fundamental category for understanding human behavior. Uh, someone could hold that uh, action, really it's better to explain human action through some kind of external point of view, just say as product of reflexes or some kind of operant conditioning, which was uh, something invented by B.F. Skinner, the Harvard psychologist. So somebody could say, well, action really isn't a very useful concept, but it, it would, someone who held that wouldn't be saying that action isn't, uh, there aren't any actions at all. So, uh, that's why I think that argument is a bit limited. It's a bit similar. There is an argument sometimes made in logic that says, well, uh, you can't really deny the law of non-contradiction because law of non-contradiction says something can't both be and not be at the same time, at least in all respects. So somebody, one of the arguments was, well, if you deny this law, if you say there can be uh, true contradictions, then you're at the same time affirming it. You're saying that uh, uh, the law is true because if there are no, uh, if there are a uh, law of non-contradiction is false, then all contradictions are true. So then it's also true that uh, no contradictions are true. So I see that argument, a lot of people accepted that argument, but fairly recently in this 20th century development really, one logician, Graham Priest, pointed out a problem with that, that someone who denies law of non-contradiction 
need not be saying that all contradictions are true. He's just saying there's at least one true contradiction. But he's not contradicting himself because he's not saying uh, that, that all contradictions are true. He's just saying there's at least one of them. So you see, it's kind of similar to this point about uh, uh, if you say that you're acting, if you deny that you're acting, you say, I'm not, not, don't think there's any action, that your denial is itself an action, that just one action. So it doesn't show that uh, uh, action is fundamental. You have to be very careful about what it is you're affirming or denying in logic. I should say there was one person who, who was, used to be a was summer fellow here for a number of years who was, uh, would, didn't agree with me on this. Uh, he would say, no, no, you have to show for each person that the person is contradicting himself if he denies that he has. He thought this was really unphilosophical to just start with the notion of action, just say, well, it's or co ordinary common sense. So I disagree with that. Maybe, maybe that's why he's no longer a fellow at the, <laughs> the programs anymore. But I think although I've disagreed with this argument, the point, the point that it's making is fundamental that the first person perspective, so we're from our own points of view, we're acting, really can't be eliminated. That say if there are various scientists or others who say all human behavior can be explained as results of certain interactions of material particles, they themselves are acting, they're doing things, they're uh, involved in using means to achieve ends. So if we try to eliminate the first person perspective, we're really doing something that undermines our own activity. So th that really can't be done. Now, let's see if I can get to the next slide. Uh, on my own. Oh, good, I made it. Okay. <laughs> I was hoping I would. Uh, I now want to mention uh, some criticisms of praxeology. And one of the most important cr uh, criticisms was raised by the logical positivists or logical empiricists, who were a group of uh, philosophers at the University of Vienna who had a group called the Vienna Circle. It was centered around the, uh, one of the philosophy professors, uh, Moritz Schlick, and there were uh, various uh, other important philosophers who were part of that circle, like uh, Rudolf Carnap was a member of it, Otto Neurath, there were various uh, other people in it. And that movement became very influential because after the Nazis took power in Austria in March 1938, uh, a lot of the people in that circle, um, many had to flee abroad. Many of them were Jewish or they were politically uh, radical. So a lot of them wound up in the U.S. or in England. So uh, the movement became very influential here. I should say uh, one of the, the logical possibilities illustrates some of the dangers of being a philosopher. Uh, there was, uh, as I say, the head of the founder of the, of the movement was Moritz Schlick. 
and there was a student uh, name of his who had gotten his PhD with Schlitt named uh, 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 Hans Nelbach, and he, uh, for the various theories of why he did this, he thought that uh, one theory is he thought Schlick was interested in a woman that he was very attracted to. And he wasn't very happy about this, so he came up to Schlick one day after his lecture and shot him dead. <laughs> and so later, I think after he did that, he was put in an insane asylum for a while. Then he got out after, I think when the Nazis came to power, he said, well, he just was trying to elim eliminate a Jewish philosopher who was uh, corrupting philosophy, although Schlick wasn't Jewish, but <laughs> <laughs> never mind that. So I think after the war, he wound up as a forest ranger. But as I say, so that's one of the, so what the positivists said was they were thought that philosophy should be made scientific. They thought that there was, uh, there'd been in metaphysics, there'd been a lot of philosophy that in their view really didn't mean anything, that didn't mean much. So they proposed uh, what they called uh, a criterion of meaning, which is called the verifiability criterion of meaning. And what this said is that they, dis they distinguished between two different types of statements, which were analytic statements and synthetic statements. Now, an analytic statement is either a definition or part of a definition, or what's called a tautology, which is a logical truth that doesn't really have any content. As an example, suppose I say uh, a bachelor is an unmarried male. That would be an example of a definition or a, a, a bachelor, a bachelor, all bachelors are male. That would be part of a definition or a a logical, uh, a tautology it would be something, I suppose I say, someone asks, how's the weather? And I say, it's either raining or not raining. So that really doesn't tell you much, but it's nevertheless true. So they said, well, that's an analytic statement. And the other kind of meaningful statement is something for it to be have some truth about the world, it has to have be testable in some way. So we would have all meaningful statements are either analytic or synthetic. And this, uh, when uh, this in praxeology, we have, remember the laws of praxeology are supposed to be uh, deduced just by thinking about them. We have a notion of action and then we think about what's involved in the action. And the, if we carried out the deductions correctly, then the uh, actions the, the, what the results of what we what, the, what we come up with are not ones that can be empirically tested at all in the sense that we can't show that they're wrong. Supposing to take in the Austrian view, you always the law of diminishing marginal utility. If you add another unit of a good, you'll put the unit of a good to a lower value uh, use than the ones that were higher on your list. 
uh, that isn't so, we can that isn't something that can be tested. We couldn't come up with a case where that's false. So what the positivist said, and this was a criticism that was made by, actually made by some of them, was they said, well, this is just, if, this is just analytic, if uh, that what the Austrians are saying is that they're just defining the lower valued use as the one that you're that you put the good to. You're just saying, well, you're you have the goods you using you always use the good to the one that ranks highest on your list so far. So then you're just defining that one that you have as the highest value as the one that you you that you actually used, or uh, they would say you've shown your preference by choosing something. So that's just you've defined preference just in that way. So the one you prefer is the one you're just defining. The one you prefer is the one you actually choose. Now that criticism isn't really right, is it? Or I, at least I hope not, because if it is right, then we're all out of business here. Uh, so what's wrong with it is that it isn't that you've defined their prefer your uh, your preference is the one that you actually choose. It's just in thinking about it, you'll see or uh, think that the you will choose your highest valued preference. That's the one you'll choose, but you've not defined it in that way. So what is really happening here is that the uh, the problem that the logical positivists are trying to solve is that they're saying that all truths about so-called so truths that we can know a priori, which means no knowing things just by thinking about them, are just ones that are analytic where that's taken to be a matter of definition. So uh, it's, that's not a theory one would have to accept. And there, as we'll see, if, we, I, can, if I have time to get to the next slide, which is in doubt, uh, Mises and Rothbard had different ways of trying to show that, but the basic idea to keep in mind is that uh, if we say we can know something by thinking about it, that's something that we, it means we can think about the world, you know, we can use our ideas, our concept to come up with truth about the world. It, it, it's it isn't saying that there, when we say something is a priori, we're not claiming it's an analytic truth in the sense of a definition. It's just claiming, we're just claiming that by thinking about things, we can discover truths about the world. So the positivists, positivists are really trying to just arbitrarily say that you can't do that, that all knowledge that isn't strictly testable isn't really about the world. There, this is really just an arbitrary assumption on their part. And we could come up, we say, well, look, in Praxeology, we're actually using 
conceptual thought to come up with truths about the world. So that shows that the, uh, this proposal is false. Now, one point about that that was one of the criticisms raised of the uh, logical positivists right away in the beginning when, I think in the 1930s, the Polish uh, phenomenologist Roman Ingarden was one of the first to bring up this criticism. Other people raised it as well, like the uh, uh, English philosopher uh, Isaiah Berlin, was that the, the statement, all truths are either analytic or empirical, doesn't itself appear to be an analytic or empirical <laughs> statement. It, it isn't analytic that uh, all truths are uh, about the world or of this kind. And if it's claimed it's an empirical statement, it seems falsified by the existence of praxeology and other disciplines, so it's rather a self-undermining type of argument. Uh, there are other problems with it as well. For example, suppose uh, we have the ethical claims, claims about morality. We say it's wrong to kill people for fun. That would have no truth value it wouldn't be a truth about the world. It's not analytic, and it's not uh, something that could be tested. So the positivists really responded to this by they accepted that they say, well, those aren't; those are just uh, expressions of a certain sort. They're just saying, I just expressions of liking or disliking. So they took, they accepted that although many, most of us wouldn't find that plausible. So then they, they would get into problems because uh, we would have the law, laws of mathematics and logic don't appear to be testable either in, them, in that sense. So what should we say the laws of logic don't apply to the world either? That doesn't seem very plausible. Uh, supposing, say, uh, we can figure out mathematically that uh, certain things about the world, we certainly think that what we come up with in the calculation has direct application to the world. This isn't a matter of something we just conventionally true. It actually is true. So that would be an example uh, showing what uh, seems like the positivist view isn't correct. Now, one point Mises made about the positivists, which was interesting. Now, he didn't claim this refuted them, but he thought that what the reason, the po or one of the main motives that the positivists had in coming up with their criterion was just to rule out praxeology. Many of them were socialists or uh, quite left-wing politically, except for Schlick, who was a classical liberal. But most of them wouldn't dislike uh, uh, praxeology because it would, if it's correct, it would show that there are errors in the whole socialist project. So Mises thought this was a reason to, this was the motive they had in coming up with uh, their criterion of meaning. He tended not so much to stress as most other people do that they were opposed to metaphysics, which didn't have much meaning. Now, one reason Mises didn't put much stress on 
their opposition to metaphysics, is that he was opposed to metaphysics himself, and he criticized it rather on the same grounds they did. So uh, I think we're about out of time now, so I just summarize and say the principal lesson we should learn, the philosophical lesson we have to learn about praxeology is that uh, philosophy isn't really basic in understanding praxeology. It's a matter of common sense. So thanks very much.